presentation I'm going to do today for you is I um, really want to talk to you, uh, obviously, the history of Armenian music played here uh, in Detroit. And I'm going to lead up to really why, 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 why I'm talking about this today. But really, for those of you that aren't Armenian and, and don't know about Armenia, I'm sorry, we're closed. <laughs> so just some, some quick... This is Jack. Give Jack a nice round of applause for doing that. Yeah, there you go. Some quick facts, really, about, about Armenia. That we're ancient people. We go back to the first century. Our language is very unique with an Indo-European uh, lettering and grammar. First Nation, and maybe a lot of you have heard this, too, certainly, to adopt Christianity back in, in the year 301. Uh, Mapping-wise and... and where, where Armenia sits, we border Turkey to the west, Georgia to the north, Azerbaijan east, Iran to the south. Today we've probably got about 8 to 10 million Armenians around the world. First uh, country to, uh, first state to uh, declare independence from the Soviet Union in 1991, and not all of us are Kim Kardashian. So I make sure you're all paying attention. That's good. They're all, everyone's listening so far. Then comes the Armenian Genocide, and this gives you a little bit of an indication of, of really where a lot of um, the, the, the mass killings were, and, and today being April 28th, four days after uh, April 24th, 99 years ago, a uh, million and a half Armenians were the beginning of the, of the execution of Armenians from Turkey. And what they first started with the leaders, the intellects, the doctors, businessmen, and the artists. And I, and I purposely say that, and we'll lead into why, uh, why that that was very important. And so again, a million and a half between 1915 and 1923, about a half a million Armenians escaped from the genocide. So new beginnings. These are, believe it or not, Armenian immigrants. And I believe this is over at Ellis Island. Talk about where the Armenians are now, really where they left from um, after the genocide. Obviously, the United States was a, a big area. California, Massachusetts, Michigan, New York. These are probably some of the bigger hubs, although not solely uh, in those four states. And then obviously Russia. These are the top two um, countries where Armenians really fled to. So for Detroit, and this, by the way, is an actual picture. You're going to find that during the course of this. I've got some rare pictures that maybe some of you have never even seen before. And it's really nice to go through this process. And again, I'll talk about why we're, what we're leading up to. And this was actually an Armenian, I'm sorry, Armenian owner right here that, um, and he had a, he had a diner in, uh, in Detroit. Armenians came to really two predominant areas in Detroit, Delray, Highland Park. Del Rey now being um, around Mexican town, about five miles from downtown Detroit. And as you can see that um, really they lived on these streets here. Salve really was a, was a big street for Armenians in the Del Rey area. As a matter of fact, when the bus would drop off uh, on Salve Street, the bus driver would yell out Armenian Boulevard. That's how many Armenians lived there. Crossley, Anderson, these are all areas, these streets, obviously they still exist within Del Rey. Highland Park is obviously another area as well. You know, folks think that the Armenians just came to Michigan uh, right after the genocide. We were here before. Prior to the genocide, it was probably around 3,000 Armenians. They started coming around the 1870s. Um, obviously, that picked up after the genocide. But they came for Henry Ford. Basically, they came to Michigan. And they came to Del Rey and Highland Park because those are where the, where the, there's some room back there if you'd like to. And they came, they came to these areas, obviously Dearborn, Melvindale, Allen Park, Pontiac, River Rouge. Some of you still live there and they <laughs> live in that area. But folks lived here because Henry Ford had the $5 work day. Immigrants came here, they looked for uh, work. Detroit was a hub for that. These are some other actual pictures. These pictures actually came from a Picnic back in um, 1933, 1934. 
Uh, this is, um, we'll talk about this picture later, but these are Detroit Armenians dancing. And this was actually up on the top right, uh, St. John's um, Armenian Bazaar back in the, I think, early 60s. But as you can see, the Armenians came here, look, you know, establishing their life here. And what included that was certainly the music and certainly the heritage that, that they brought with it. So I want to talk to you a little bit about some of the musicians that, that made, made this happen. Hyde Krikorian that I've circled here, this is a picture actually out in uh, Chelsea, Mass. Hyde Krikorian was a clarinet player uh, that eventually made his way to Detroit. Hyde, Zurnaji Hyde they used to call him because he played the, um, the instrument, the oboe reed instrument, the Zurna, played it in the old country. Uh, and they nicknamed him Zor Naji Haig. Any of the musicians that was considered master of their instrument, that instrument was, um, was always preceded their, their actual name. So Zor Naji Haig was actually lived between 1888 and died in the mid 70s, responsible for teaching a number of different younger Armenians in, in Detroit to play clarinet. Two prominent Armenian clarinetists, one being Simon Javizian, if any of you know who Simon is, Haig taught Simon to play clarinet, and the other one being Hachi Kazarian. So this is, this is the fellow that taught, as a matter of fact, this picture uh, came from Hachi. It's the only one that really exists. He was a Vanetsi musician. Um, again, this was an Italian uh, concert band. He uh, was not a full-time musician like a lot of us were not full-time musicians. And he owned Golden Gate Cleaners in Detroit. So again, he passed away in the mid-70s, but very instrumental, obviously, in, in shaping the kind of music that we have here um, in Detroit. This next band, and so I apologize, some of these pictures are hard to see because there's not many of these pictures that exist, unfortunately. But this is Derta Tokoyan's band, and it actually says on here uh, Derta. But you can see that what's kind of neat about uh, this picture is really how they played um, and how they amplified themselves. This is just a speaker that they would sit in front of, uh, in front of the musicians, a piano bench, so they can have their cigarette and their, their ashtray on there. And they all played acoustically, violin, clarinet, oud, and then drum set. We didn't have the Arabic drum or the Middle Eastern drum, didn't really come into existing, uh, existence yet. Der Todd lived on Oakman Boulevard in Highland Park. He was born in Armenia. He was a punch press operator in the auto industry as a young man and then eventually owned a dry cleaners. You'll see there's a common thread. We owned a lot of dry cleaners. Uh, he eventually did uh, retire and, and passed away uh, in Fresno, California. He is, uh, Dare Todd is thought to have been maybe one of the first musicians to play at the nightclubs in, in Detroit. There was one called the, the Barnaby Coast uh, where he used to play at, and so he was known for, for certainly playing, playing that. Uh, which one is Dare Todd? This is Dare, playing clarinet. Oh, okay. Thank you. That's Dare Todd. This picture. I love this picture for a lot of reasons. One, it's clear. Uh, secondly, um, you've got some kids, Armenian kids dancing. This picture came from, uh, if those of you that don't bear Azizian, this picture came from her wedding. So the problem with finding these photographs or any kind of clippings is, you know, when you go to folks, and if I'm going to the older generation, I'm asking for, do you have pictures? I said, well, we don't walk around with a camera. It was really only at the weddings. And even then, you know, you had to be a little bit well-to-do to have a photographer at a wedding. You could tell this is, I mean, a very nice and crisp picture. This is Haigo Hanyan, this smiley fellow right here. <laughs> I actually had the opportunity to talk to him about 25 years ago. Greg, you may even remember that. Yeah. So Greg and I, that's sitting, he's hiding in the back. Greg and I started a record label together back in 91, I think, was when we were doing it. And what we did was we took some of the 78, old, old 78 RPM records and put them together 
and a number of the records that were uh, accessible was, was Haig Ohanyan. What's interesting about Haig, uh, obviously he's playing, he was one of the only ones in Detroit that would play this instrument here, which is a tar, T-A-R, which was really more of, uh, back then, more of an Eastern Armenian, Persian uh, type, uh, type instrument. You had other musicians that would play banjo or mandolin later on that had a similar sound to the tar. But what was it, what's interesting is, is uh, you could tell that Haig has got a uh, uh, Armenian look to him, but the others probably don't as much. Uh, blue eyes, kind of uh, white hair, kind of blonde hair kind of thing. None of his musicians were Armenian. Haig actually used uh, union musicians from Detroit to play in his band. The reason being was he wanted ultimate control of how that sound would operate. And so you could see that they're all using sheet music. He'd write out all the sheet music for them to play. And this, by the way, and we're going to get to this later, but uh, some of you may recognize sort of this backdrop and, and uh, some of the curtains. And this is the old Finlater building uh, that we'll talk about a little bit later on um, Lafayette. And yes. I don't remember. I want to say there's uh, there's no more than uh, just four pegs. Right? Yeah, but there's um, I think there might be between four to eight strings to it. Yeah, this uh, instrument is two pieces of wood actually. This is a hollowed out piece of wood shaped like a uh, figure eight. There's this is all skin on the uh, on the face of it with obviously the with the neck and then the uh, pegboard to it, played, and these are usually metal strings on that instrument. You can also see just some of the sort of the microphones that are in, that are in place that would uh, pick, up, pick up some of the sounds. Um, Haig was actually the first uh, host of the Armenia Radio Hour in Detroit, too. So that, I think, happened probably, oh, I think early 1940s. He had a uh, program here, program on the East Coast, and then eventually had one in California. He also started a record label too. So he had a uh, label called uh, High Art, H-I-G-H, -H, uh, High Art Enterprises. He recorded a ton of different records. There, as a matter of fact, at the uh, Armenian Community Center, maybe about 20 years ago, there were, there were boxes of uh, brand new records that he had there that he that he had kept there or that that uh, I think we all inherited but that's Haig. Unique too let me go if I can go back this was the only um, really the musician that played more of the Eastern Armenian music it was more he was considered more of your classical musician in town and if you're having a, a big to-do of an affair this is who you got you didn't really necessarily go after some of the other musicians. Now some of these folks may look very familiar to you. Again, you notice the same background of the, uh, of the stage, but this is the Von Eitz band, and I talked about Khachi Kazarian earlier. That's, that's him. Yeah, he's about uh, 12, 13 years old. This fellow way on the left is Miran Kuyam, uh, Kuyumjin, uh, Khachi's brother, who passed away a few years, Kazar. Uh, this fellow here that looks like uh, Jed Clampett, <laughs> is uh, Andy Shemalian. Uh Andy is still around. Andy is still with us. And then on the right uh, is uh, Amo. Back then he went by Amo Goldoyan, but his name is Ara Goldoyan, and he, and he played oud. Again, you could see the instrumentation. Back then they started he started to use uh, drums, but uh, same kind of setup. You've got a amp in front, and uh, usually the amp was for the oud player because that was the hard instrument to hear. Everybody else, he had no problems listening to both the um, drum or the clarinet. Another band, same building by the way, in the basement, Yervat Gurdjikian. And uh, from left to right we've got, and, and here's the problem, some of these folks I don't have last names for and uh, still doing that kind of research. This is Simon, this is Antrenig on the uh, Yervat, on clarinet, 
and uh, Mike on the drum set. Again, you notice we're still using uh, drum sets for the most part. He probably came around the time uh, Dare Todd's band that I talked about uh, came. This is another one. I don't think any of you have seen this picture, and I, I need a little bit more information on this, but um, John Negotian is a Negotian, I should say, is playing the oud, and actually he's just tuning the oud here a little bit. Very common to have uh, not only musicians, but you know the partiers also sitting on stage <laughs> right, right next. We've, uh, we've come a long way. We don't now sit on the stage, we stand in front of it and stare. But back then, we sat with cigar in mouth, belt pulled up as high as possible. <laughs> and we sat there and we enjoyed the music. Uh, I got this picture from um, his grandson, uh, uh, Kelly Negotian, who lives in town still. And Kelly's father uh, was also a musician, Mike. Uh, Armenians would know him as Mike the Plumber. Uh, as it were, but Mike played also the uh, kanun and played, uh, I think, oud as well. This, this picture probably goes back to the uh, early 20s here in Detroit. This should ring a bell a little bit. I talked about Simon Javizian earlier. Uh, this is Simon's band, uh, the Ardziv band. And on the left on the drums is a non-Armenian named Ken Dobson. This is 1954, this picture was taken. Simon Javizian obviously playing clarinet on... The guy? Yes, the funeral guy. <laughs> Simon was a prominent funeral director. Before that, he played clarinet. <laughs> the story that Simon tells is that uh, Work was getting in the way, and he didn't have as much time uh, to play music. Actually, he told me once, but he sort of denies it now, that, that it got in the way it, when he was playing a wedding on a Saturday night and burying some of the next night, probably not good for business. Yeah. So, but Simon uh, was a very good clarinet player back in the day, and this was uh, before he sang. He sang a little bit later on. Harry Bakayan is a uh, oud player that actually started with Simon. Um, when Simon started the band, he needed all these different musicians, and, and Harry was somebody that started to play oud in that band. On the end is Eddie Shiroyan, and you can see he's playing the mandolin. We talked a little bit earlier about um, the, um, the banjo and the, the uh, mandolin sounding similar to, um, to the tar. Uh, and, and so folks played, played mandolin back then. Uh, Eddie actually played with a lot of different bands throughout, throughout the years. So he's, he, you could see him really uh, coming forward on a lot of different things. Let me show you, and this is now, this is a clip. I, I did a, a concert. There's some seats up here, if you don't mind paying $50 a head. I did a concert last year um, uh, in the city of Detroit, and when, when we, um, before the concert, I did a presentation similar to this. I didn't have nearly as much information now as I did maybe a year ago. Um, but Simon, Simon, who really doesn't live here that much anymore, he comes back for work. Um, this I was able to capture when he was here. Um, a year ago, and, and I'm going to show you just a little bit of a clip. He talks about how he started and why he started his first, first band. Uh, it was uh, three years after he died. I was 14 years old. And in those days, uh, because people still had economic financial problems, they couldn't have big weddings. And they couldn't hire halls. There were a lot of weddings that were in private homes. And so our neighbors across the street married their son off, and we were close friends with them, so we were invited there. And we're sitting around there, and one of the men, Mike, uh, oh, why did I forget Mike's name? Uh, Markaria, Mike Markaria, Shorty Mike, who played banjo. And he played in some of the bands sometimes with banjo. 
Uh, and that sounded a lot like the RV in the car, right? Okay. So he was there at the wedding. And he said, hey, Simon, he says, these people are sitting here. They need music to, da to dance to. He says, uh, you got your clarinet. Do you have your uncle's drum set yet? I said, yeah, it's in the basement. He says, you bring your uncle's drum set here. And we set up in the living room. And he played the drums, I played the clarinet, and the people got up and they danced. Mm -hmm. And Mike turned to my father and said, Varavarkia, Simon shows a lot of promise, and I would really love to have you trust him with me, and let's start a band. Mm -hmm. And I said, oh, I'd love to do that, in honor of my uncle, and keep my uncle's name going. We started a band. I was 14 years old. That's that's just a clip. I when I interviewed uh, Simon last year, there's probably about two hour, two hours of information. Uh, Simon, for those of you that don't know, is 83, 84 years old, smart as a whip, and um, his memory is is very much intact. So, tells a lot of jokes. So Simon's uh, recollection of of history with Armenian music is fantastic. And hearing how he first started playing music is very important. I have a question, Gal, I'm sorry. That's okay. The RG band, there was an icon on the drums? Yes. I didn't recognize the other guy. It wasn't Mount Ararat, I know that. So what it's, is an it's an eagle. eagle. It's an eagle. Oh, it's an eagle. I can see it. That's what RG means. That's the name of the band, RG. I did not know that. Now you know. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> no fighting in the back, please. Okay, now we're moving on. All right, now these pictures look. <laughs> so half of the relatives are here, I could see. So this, and, and as, as you can see, the, the closer we're getting now to 50s, 60s, some of these pictures are going to be a lot clearer. Publicity picture for the Adox band. Um, Berge Manassian, Corey Tesoyan, Art Melkonian, uh, Tom Manassian, Eddie Arvanigan, and Adam Manugian. This was, this was the Adox band. And uh, sadly, I think, I'm not sure about Tom Manassian, but sadly everybody has passed away in this, in this group. Is he still alive? Uh, well, Art is playing uh, clarinet. He's still? Okay, good. Because my records show that he passed away back in 83. If you're telling me I'm wrong, that's good. That's why you're all here. That's partly why you're all here. Oh, well then, he's very much alive. <coughs> Forget this. Yeah, that's good to know. So anyway, there, there's a great significance for this band, and let me tell you why. This, uh, this band ended up recording a song that it, 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 it says here broke all, broke all sales records in Detroit in one day. It's very true. They took a um, Middle Eastern sort of belly dance song, to be quite honest, turned it into this Armenian uh, still belly dance kind of dance song. They changed the name. You know, we had to uh, Americanize it, called it the Armenian Jazz Sextet. That's publicity photo, obviously, from, from putting that together. And they recorded this song called The Harem Dance. And this is right out of the newspaper. Uh, this photo here is actually out of the, out of the uh, program. And i give you a little bit of an example. You see on the top left, for those of you that are uh, old time Detroiters, Don McLeod heard them. Heard them play music. Said, this is great. Can you record this song? So it was this group. Uh, I also have it. Uh, on good knowledge that there are a few other musicians that are on that record, one being Khachik, but I think he was, may have been 13, 14 years old and, and couldn't, you know, couldn't be uh, really part of the group. But again, this was the group, this was the band, <coughs> it's still the Adox band, but, but just to give you an example of where we are, just these are local DJ um, charts. Don McLeod being uh, from WJBK, was very famous here with Mickey Shore, uh, and, um, and these folks really, they took this record and they went to town. But take a look at uh, really what they were up against. They, number five is Fats Domino. 
Um, but, but even the top 10 was Elvis Presley, and here they're number two. There's, there's countless numbers of uh, clippings like this that show where they are, but it gives you an idea of the kinds of music that they did. And this was an absolute hit. I mean, this, this uh, went, hit the Billboard charts, and, and it was a local Detroit Armenian band that did it. This translated a little bit later on into really the high tone band. The, the, um, uh, the Manassian boys got drafted, went to, went to the army, you know, times go on, musicians come and go. And so we've got what's, what was called the high tone band. Corey uh, Tesoyan again, and now we've introduced oud player Kelly Kachukian, again, Adam Manugian and John Sarkisian, but led with Hachi Kazarian, very young. Kachi Kazarian in, the, in this picture. The name High Tone Band uh, came from driving uh, Kelly, lived in Pontiac, I believe at the time. And they, uh, as they were driving down Woodward, uh, went by High Tone Cleaners. Again, cleaners. <laughs> so they saw that and somewhere in one of those car rides back and forth, they came up with the High Tones. This band was probably by far at that point one of the most popular Groups that really, really changed, um, really changed the the landscape of Armenian music here. This is uh, this is this is late 50s <coughs> through the mid to late 60s. Okay, thank you. Yeah, right, right, right. Okay, and um, also that was different with this as well is that. They, um, you know, both uh, John and, and Adam played regular hourglass-shaped Middle Eastern drums, or they played a cocktail drum, a very big cocktail drum if they wanted. There's a couple of seats, guys, if you want to grab a seat in the back. How are you? Nice to see you again. Nice to see you. Yeah. So they changed the landscape of of Armenian music for forever, really. Again, no more drum sets. We had Middle Eastern drums and so forth. So a little bit about where they played. Now, um, I'll be very truthful. This picture was not from Detroit. Uh, this picture actually was from Boston, but uh, very reminiscent of really what you would find in um, Greektown, uh, the Arab clubs, or even really just some of the other clubs. You could see that there's all the instruments on, on stage. I got that picture actually from a uh, Greek musician that, was, that played there three nights a week. But this picture actually was taken here, uh, and this was done in, in Greek town, and this was probably in the, I think this was the, the mid-50s. This picture was taken actually from the Detroit News. Um, again, not Armenian musicians, but Greek musicians. But there's something very important about this because the Armenians played with the Greeks, they played with the Arabs, they played with the Jews, they played with the Turks even. They, th there was not any of that, um, I can't play with you because you're not Armenian. They played together, they played, the Greeks would play Armenian music, the, the Armenians would play Greek music. I mean, this is, this is the landscape of, of how, it, how it occurred. There was a lot of nightclubs. You had the Stockade Inn, which was probably the very first uh, nightclub in Detroit. Ironically enough, not everything was done in Greektown, certainly, but um, the Stockade was in uh, Delray, called Stockade because behind it was an actual stockade and the train station was right behind it where they did slaughter the cows and everything else. But this, there was a, um, uh, just an American bar owner that said, uh, a lot of Armenians that live around here, uh, and I've got live music. Why don't I translate that into a couple of nights of, of, of Armenian dance music? They packed it. They packed it. Thursday, Friday, Saturday night was Armenian music. Um, hard to find any kind of memorabilia from that. Again, you know, when you talk to, you know, your generation, you went to the stockade. Um, you didn't go with a camera. No. But uh, you could probably tell stories about just going to the stockade and seeing all these musicians. A lot of these musicians that we talked about certainly played there. There were countless other different ones. The stockade really was the first one that, that really kind of kicked it off. 
Um, and like anything else, that tradition has not changed today. As restaurants and nightclubs go on, they go out of business, something new pops up. Greektown, probably the only consistent um, you know, nightclub uh, district for, for many years to actually have a lot of live music. Um, but they existed throughout Metro Detroit, and they moved around as the Detroit Armenians moved around. So the music was very much alive. Also, it goes without saying that where the Armenian churches and the community centers were, that's where that music was, was probably first heard in this community. So all those pictures that I showed you, some in the basement, some upstairs with the, with the Mount Ararat in the background and, and the curtains and whatnot was the old Finlater. And it's probably where we get the most of pictures and whatnot, because mainly because of weddings that, that certainly took place there. Yes. What's the guy smoking on, right? Oh, he's smoking the water pipe. Yeah. That's what you focus on? Wow. Wow. So here's some more of the pictures. Again, this is, this is a picture of the Finlater, and this came off of actually an old flyer. You could drive by this building. Um, very similar today. It's still it's being used today. Um, Greek town, uh, certainly again, really down this strip, Grecian Gardens. Athens Bar was another very popular restaurant uh, that had a lot of uh, Armenian Middle Eastern music. Sammy G's, 619 East McNichols, three blocks east of Woodward. Big venue for, for Middle Eastern music. Here's some old newspaper clippings. And uh, I, I love this one. Okay, Sammy G, Sammy, uh, Sam Gabriel, who, out, who lives now on the uh, West Coast, um, had a club for really only about four or five years. Not very long, but if you talk to people, you hear about their, their experiences, their memories about it, which seems like it went for, for 20 years. But uh, look how, you know, for those of you that remember Uncle Herman, there's Uncle Herman. Um, back then, when we had these clubs and, and uh, folks were dancing, there was one Armenian lion dance. There weren't three or four or 20 of them as there were today. There was one, and there was one leader, and there was one leader controlling that. Maybe not the best picture of Uncle Herman, but Uncle Herman made, was, was the announcer, the MC. Again, very popular in the day to do something like that, but he controlled that line. And for, for many years, this band here on the right, again, this is, again, the high tones. If you could pick out their pictures in this old panorama ad, uh, obviously they had more than just Middle Eastern music. They had a variety of different ethnic music and jazz music, but these guys played there. Probably the, the, the most well-known nightclub that this band played, you know, for, during all those, all those years. I want to talk about some of these fellows too. Um, these are not musicians that lived in Detroit, although this picture was actually taken in Detroit and is used quite extensively on the left. And why he's a big picture is because, uh, again, we, I talked about how their, uh, their title, their surname, if you will, had their instrument. This was Udi Harat. He played the Udi, he also played violin, obviously. Uh, blind Armenian musician, um, born in Turkey, uh, came to the United States a number of different times over the years. In the early 60s, he came to Detroit. There were a number of um, Armenian businessmen and, and those that loved the music that wanted to bring him to this country, paid for his trip to come here. This is not something we would ever really even think about doing today, but they brought him here tried to see if they could get his eyesight repaired. They weren't able to do that, but they also set him up in several concerts, out west and then out east, but obviously Detroit was always a hub. So Udi Hanat came here uh, a number of different times. This actual picture, it's got writing on it from 1956. Uh, this picture was taken. Again, very popular uh, musician. His music still being played today. His compositions still heard today. One of the most well-known uh, Armenian composers uh, and musicians of the 20th century. Um, he played with another fellow, uh, Garbis. Garbis played Kanun, 
call, they called him Kanuni Garbis. Uh, also, again, very well known uh, musician, came to Detroit as well. Again, probably not as well known as, as Hanat was, but nevertheless, uh, a very important musician that came here and, and traveled with uh, Hanat. Then on the top right was uh, Marco Melcon. Um, Alam Sharin was his Armenian name. Uh, Marco ended up, uh, he was, uh, he lived in Smyrna for a number of years, played a lot with a lot of Greek musicians. Did not come to Detroit that often. I think he came really only a couple of times back in the early 60s, but ended up retiring out in the West Coast. So just to give you a sort of a, a, a taste of the types of musicians that came to visit here to play with musicians here, um, or also they would do their own solo thing. Now, I wanna play this for you because this leads into, and hopefully I won't mess it up again, but this leads into why we're kind of talking about this. Each note tells a story, a specific story of the Armenian people, a race of people that began over 5,000 years ago. We were the first adopters of Christianity. In 1915, close to 100 years ago, Armenians were driven from their ancestry homelands by the order of the Turkish Ottoman Empire. Over 1.5 million Armenians were massacred. Those that escaped and survived fled to other parts of the globe. Many came to America to find peace and begin a new life. These survivors brought with them not personal wealth, but identity, traditions, and music. Our music survived because our people survived. Many didn't come to this country with instruments to relay the folk songs to the next generation of musicians. They, they sung the songs, they hummed, they whistled what they knew. The music described a simple village life, which included love, happiness, sadness, despair. Now, this was never taken from us. So as an Armenian, I feel that I have an obligation to help pass this music on to future generations. Unlike the immigrants that came to this country with the songs in their head, I can do so through actual recordings. Detroit has always been called a melting pot of people and cultures, a place for thousands of immigrants to settle and create a life for their families. As an Armenian born in America, this was no different from my parents and grandparents who eventually settled in this country and in the metro Detroit area. The music is my identity and tells a distinct story that continues to share with the new Armenian generation so they never forget. It's also meant to educate non-Armenian audiences that otherwise may never know about or hear the beautiful and rich music of Armenia. So this is just sort of a, a, a video clip that Brian uh, helped when we were, when I did this concert, um, it really didn't have the, the idea of, well, where are we going with this? We, you know, we, we recorded this concert last year in Detroit, <clears throat> came out fantastic, thought, hey, we'll release it. But what ended up happening was really just sort of, you know, the, the, this documentary project. And that's why, and some of you know what this is about and some of you may not, but I really want to talk to you about w where I'm going with all of this. Um, last year I had applied for a grant that I received from the Knight Foundation where I submitted to them that I wanted to do um, a retrospective documentary that's never been done before featuring the history of Armenian folk music here in Detroit. Um, Knight Foundation loved it. Loved it for a couple reasons. One, there's Detroit. Um, Detroit's coming back. It's, it's a positive story. And then it's history that for maybe a handful of us, those are the only ones that know. So getting this grant, um, I had to do a, uh, it was called a challenge grant, which meant I had to raise the funds for that first, and then they verify those funds once I get to that point, and then they release the, the remaining funds, the, the grant. So I matched that. I did get all the funding for that. So we're, we're in that phase now of really putting scripts together, doing the research, finding newspaper clippings like, you, like I found, and I've even found some eight millimeter footage, um, but what's gonna come with this are really filmed interviews. Um, interviews from some of you, actually, that are in here, I've talked to. Some of the nightclub owners that are still around or relatives of thereof. 
uh, and some of the musicians. There's, there's probably there's probably a good dozen musicians that are still around. You know, unfortunately, this is a story that I wish I did 10 years ago. I didn't have the idea to do it 10 years ago because we've lost so many good musicians and good stories from them. But I'm hoping to still still get their story through their relatives and, and really get an understanding of what it was like. I mean, these musicians really shaped the music here. I mean, they were, in my opinion, the, the identifiers for the Armenian culture here. You know, 1.5 million Armenians get massacred. They leave, they come here. They come here to start brand new. They come to open restaurants. They come to open bakeries. You name it. And dry cleaners. <laughs> Someone's listening. Gas stations. Gas stations. Gas stations. So they came here to rebuild their life. And, and certainly music, you know, I think is a great identifier of, of one's culture. And... And certainly, um, it, it tells a remarkable story. Uh, once we do all these interviews, put all of this together, put do the post production and clean it up, then the pitch goes to Detroit Public Television, which um, they're already interested in. It. They were interested in it in it last year. Brian has actually done some work for PBS. I've done some work for for PBS, and I know that they're quite interested in in seeing something like this. So the goal is to have this produced have this ready to air on local television next year uh, in commemoration of the 100th anniversary of the Armenian Genocide. So could use help, always use help. Um, you could see that here's a, a list of things you know, that are very, very difficult to find. Um, uh, and some of you have have provided some of that and I'm very grateful of it but there's a number of different events that that have gone on you know during the course of the last 40 or 50 years that uh, if we could find um, material for that I've got a um, uh, eight millimeter uh, film of a uh, wedding that features uh, maybe three minutes of the high tones and then some other dancers uh, John Sarkeesian said, yeah, we, we filmed half of those concerts out at Sammy G's, so there's some nightclub, hopefully, footage from that. Um, that's going to really make it. But these are the kinds of things. So we need help. Can't really do it alone. Looking for whatever we can. Um, really, probably from the, if we can, the, the 20s to the 50s. It seems, obviously, it's, the closer we get with, with uh, time, the easier it is to find stuff. So Finding a lot of that early stuff is essential. That's how you get a hold of me. So um, I'd open up for any kind of questions or thoughts, but if you find material, if you find photographs, I'm very good about taking them, taking very good care of them, scanning them, sending them back very promptly. Thank you for coming, I appreciate it.